So um, I am a historian of the Coast Survey, and NASUS is in Canada for once, and the United States and Canada have boundaries, and the Coast Survey, going all the way back to the founder, Ferdinand Hassler, has been involved in various respects in dealing, describing, relocating the boundaries between Canada and the United States for over two centuries now. So I thought that I would you know, take, that, take on that subject. And um, I was particularly galvanized by one comment whose source, I, unfortunately, I can't remember, I, I can't remember the name of, but he said that the United States and Canada were unique amongst the very large nations on the earth in their profound isolation in that the only nations that they touched were each other and fish. And I just, I found that like a galvanizing concept and I have no idea how I've ended up in a session on social theory, but I figure it has to be the fish. <laughs> or in the, in the wonderful French uh, translation of the abstract, les poissons. So like any statement that seems you know, important, it's in fact erroneous. If you look up in the north, Nunavut and Greenland are very closely related and, and ecologically and culturally really can't be separated in any meaningful way. And on the south, the United States doesn't just touch Mexico, but it embraces it in an undulating situation that constantly threatening to roll itself up into a juicy enchilada, which causes certain dotards to go absolutely crazy, <laughs> uh, evidently. So I'm going to be dealing you know, with this, this whole concept of these major things about the boundaries of these two nations that supposedly touch very little else. Except, in fact, they don't just touch dozens or hundreds of other nations. They lay on top of them and squash them down. And have done that for half a millennium now. This is just one of dozens to hundreds of different kind of evocations of near contemporary, recent historical, presumed prehistoric distributions of Indian language families in North America. And uh, just, it, it just if, I, if you'd seen Thomas McGurk's wonderful, dense presentation yesterday, it was just, it just he, he spoke very eloquently about a whole bunch of stuff. Here and there you see certain dashed lines that represent the boundaries of these great nations overlaid on top. And clearly there's absolutely no correlation of any kind, right? So on the one hand, addressing and dealing and reifying and constructing and deconstructing the boundaries between the United States and Canada is a way of not dealing with everything else or dealing with everything else in a, in, uh, in a certain manner that goes with a long trajectory. Now, one of the interesting things about how Canada and the United States ended up as they are is the curious presence and disguised absence of the great colonial power of the French. And I put this in especially for the gringos in the audience because a lot of people in the United States might not realize that there is actually a part of France offshore from North America. You can see it over there to the east uh, near uh, Newfoundland. When you talk about French Canadian, this is literally it. Uh, those islands there are France and Newfoundland is now part of, of Canada. That, uh, the, the line segment there is not a seawall erected as an impediment to the fish. That's Google's way of representing the territorial sea division between France and Canada in the one place where it exists in the New World. Nevertheless, the French presence and presence in absence is everywhere. It's just amazing. For example, the, the, the Coast Survey made all kinds of maps and curated them in various ways in numerical sequences and all kinds of stuff. The Coast Survey also had the library and archives collection. 
which is just a major resource. And I was, uh, I was lucky to be able to scan as much of it as I could in, in its inaccessible place in National Archives too, in College Park, Maryland. The Library and Archives Collection, this is a scientific agency that had a gazillion maps coming and going through its offices. And there was a tiny subset of those maps that people said, that's important enough to put it in the Library and Archives Collection. So this is, a, a, a wonderful uh, solution to the four color problem. <clears throat> it's a map from the 1920s from the, the province of Quebec, and it's showing political units like election units round about Montreal. But if you look at the full version of the thing, it's just, it's very incredible. You know, on the, to the north of the St. Lawrence River are the traditional French long lot land divisions. To the south of the river are shires and counties of England with a combination of, of French and English names. All of this is Quebec now, but built in to the, the political structure of the province are these distinctions that go back centuries that all ended in one sense in 1780 when New France ended in North America. And this became the, 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 you know, the property of the British. But in another sense, it continues in, very, in all kinds of ways. So mapping the boundaries between Canada and the United States, these, these, it's a never ending process. Every human generation, at least, there is some kind of redetermination, more specific determination, remonumentation, shifts, et cetera, in the boundaries. This is the index screen or index map for the last time that the Coast and Geodetic Survey was directly involved <clears throat> in working out permutations of the, of, the, of the boundary between Canada and the United States, starting along the coast of Maine and around Quebec. And the, so you can see the footprints of the individual maps. The maps are very strange. They're mainly negative space because they're only doing precise topographic mapping of the area immediately adjacent to the border, going all the way around uh, from Maine to a certain distance beyond. This particular section addresses the village of Bibi, which exists simultaneously in Vermont and also in Quebec. And specifically, is, uh, you know, pulling right in there, the boundary line is right there in the middle. I've highlighted this little section of it in yellow showing <clears throat> the Canadian United States boundary passing through a house. It's still the case. There's the house. This is the Google Earth version of this situation. It, this was in the news recently because, because of the heightened security, ICE regulations and so on, that the inhabitants of that house had to work out a special deal with the American authorities so that they could move in between the rooms of the house and in the front and backyards without any excessive paperwork. Outside the yard lines of the house, th those rules don't apply. So, now, you know, um, a, a recurrent theme in all these things that this, this wave of European colonization began on the Atlantic and moved ever westward. Similar to the admonitions of Nokomis, the old woman on the shores of Gichigumi of the shining big sea water, stood Nokomis, the old woman, pointing with her finger westward, or the water pointing westward to the purple clouds of sunset. A wonderful little section from the Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a great poet, Whose, whose poem was in many respects reviled in the 19th century because he was too sympathetic to Indians and then dismissed in the 20th and 21st centuries as being hopelessly archaic. His younger brother was Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow and he's one of the most pleasant and wonderful uh, discoveries and rediscoveries of my career in the history of the Coast Survey because Alexander Longfellow was a major cartographer of the Coast Survey who was involved in many aspects of topographic mapping and mapping the U.S.-Canadian boundary. 
he was also just an absolute life-loving goofball. And the, the, the caption up ahead, AWL, going to matrimony. He loved life, he loved his wife, he loved everything. So in 1850, when he was in the beginning stages of his Coast Survey career, he did this sketch while he and the crew were working on Richmond's Island, which is a little island offshore from the coast of Maine, a little southeast of, of Portland, Maine. And although this, the, the sketch is quick and, you know, just and imprecise, it beautifully captures in a wonderful way the real life work of a topographic surveying party on the shores with the, the, not, the, the, the very obligatory umbrella, which is not an affectation, the umbrella constantly shades the theodolite to, to prevent temperature changes that will affect the accuracy of the instrument. Offshore is the hydrographic surveying party there. And this gets hard to see, but just a quick pencil sketch, <clears throat> absolutely accurate. The leadman throwing the lead line ahead of the whale boat being, being oared so that when the lead goes down, it'll be the, 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 the ship, the boat will be adjacent to it so that the horizontal position, which is acquired from triangulation to shore, can then be correlated with the vertical depth. This is the oldest known depiction of hydrographic surveying in the American context. Ale uh, Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow came along in a time when in the immediate aftermath of some great difficulties between Great Britain and the United States, which is to say Canada and the United States, and there were certain unfortunate affairs like the Carolyn matter in 1836 when a, a big dispute between Canadians and Americans re resulted in Canadians setting fire to a, a steamship and letting it go over Niagara Falls. In the aftermath of that, and in the aftermath of all kinds of unpleasantries about the War of 1812 and, and, and constant war and revolution before that for a very long time, things settled down into place. So as we move ever, ever westward, ever westward, like Nokomis indicated, here, again, there's the traditional dashed line <clears throat> representing the actual border boundary between these two countries. But the reality is, we are in the nation of fish. The Great Lakes is a system, and it is administered as a system of lakes in an integrated watershed. And there are many, many problems with this, but this is one of the great triumphs of ecological management on the planet at this point, in terms of the relative stability of the Great Lakes as a system and the cooperation between the two nations in the International Joint Commission. And <clears throat> the Great Lakes is the fictional place on the southern, the southern shore of Lake Michigan where Henry Wadsworth Mods, uh, Wad, uh, Longfellow moved the domain of the actual historical Hiawatha, who was Haudenosaunee, he was in the Iroquois Confederation, moved them over to a more picturesque site in the Great Lakes. Then beyond that, beyond the Great Lakes, you get into the Boundary Waters area. And again, there, there's, I tried to find a map that as clearly as possible indicated the actual dashed line that's that constant undulating thing. But it's so difficult because all, these areas are so complex in terms of water and land. But then at a certain point, and I didn't do anything to enhance this map, at a certain point, you get into the straightest white man's line that you can imagine that just runs across the country. This is the legacy of the Oregon Treaty of 1846. And that particular treaty was solidifying a particular latitudinal line that is going to be that section of the boundary between, the, between Great Britain and the United States. This is the fundamental cartography of the Oregon Treaty of 1846. Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow was a fundamental part of the party that did it. His cartography is the map of the seating arrangement of the banquet table in Washington, D.C. 
when the high potentates of the United States and Great Britain celebrated the, the, this achievement. And this, this, is, uh, this has never been published and it's never been scanned until about two months ago when I was there at the Longfellow Historic Site in Cambridge, Mass. So if we look at it, the President of the Senate, Secretary of War, all these people that have BBG and, and BB, they're, they're, you know, the British whatever kind of thing. And on the other side, Alexander up above there, uh, some sort of award I think that he gave himself, Daniel Webster, you know, standing out, standing in as a for somebody else, etc. Irony upon irony here. This is a whole crowd of people at the highest level of American and British society speaking English to each other, celebrating their achievement of getting this boundary. But the entire banquet was in French. Again, it's just over and over. The the French you know, the subterranean presence of the French that keeps coming up all over the place. Okay, now we get over to another ocean, a whole lot more fish, and this whole colonial process now starting on the west and going east as opposed to east going west. This is one of my favorite maps. Uh, this was done by Tauro Alpha and Associates. It's in this beautiful uh, USGS publication, big oversized publication, the, the Atlas of Oblique Maps, published about 1980, still available for $7. So here, clearly defined, you can see the boundaries clearly, going from the west, Alaska, British Columbia and the Yukon Territory, Alberta and the Northwest Territories, and a little bit of Nunavut. Well, the boundaries are nowhere clearly defined. Well, how, how did this whole thing come about? Well, what are some other alternative ways of, of, of identifying features and boundaries there. 1875, John Wesley Powell published the very first map of distribution of Indian languages in that whole area. The work was done by William Dahl and George Davidson of the Coast Survey. And then later on in terms of this area called the Panhandle, uh, in 1893, I think, I think it was, the great anthropologist Franz Boas did his own map in Petermann's of uh, the distribution of language families going, running along the Northwest Pacific Coast there. How did Alaska, as differentiated from the rest of what's now Canada, happen? This is a Russian postage stamp from 1991, so it's already about a human generation old, but it's referencing an event 250 years earlier in 1741 when Vitus Bering laid claim to all of Alaska all the way down to the panhandle of Alaska, as it's called, without, until the very end, actually stepping foot on the shore of Alaska. He did it all from out at sea, 20 to 40 miles offshore. He saw and named Mount St. Elias and determined that the closest whole degree of longitude to that would be the dividing line between the Tsar's land on the west and, and the King of Great Britain's land on the east. So, in the 1820s, all of this started coming together in a series of treaties. 1820, a treaty between the United States and New Spain, now called Mexico, that defined the, 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 the boundaries of New Spain as such relative to the United States. 1824, a UK sea between Great Britain, or excuse me, between the United States and the Tsar of Imperial Russia that defined another part of the boundary, and then in 1825, UKC between the Tsar and the King of Great Britain. And specifically, there was, there was a lot of commotion over it for some time about exactly where that line was gonna be because it was defined verbally. In a lot of the texts, there's this curious thing where they talk about the, the prolongation as far as the frozen ocean, capitalized. Why is that? It's because this was not the UKC at all. All of, those, all of those treaties between these great powers, the United States, Spain, Great Britain, etc., were all written in French. And for whatever reason, la mer glaciale, they capitalized glaciale. So that turned into the frozen ocean. When gold got discovered, progressively ever farther north, it became important to nail down more specifically what that boundary was. So, Great Britain, 
and the United States decided to do their own astronomical positionings, and if they were close enough, then the, they would split the difference. So the British Canadian effort was led by William Ogilvy, and this is one, he was a, a pioneer in many things, including landscape photography. That little spruce tree there represents the apparent, the, the actual uh, longitudinal boundary line. It was reused endlessly in other forms. To this day, the way you Alaskify or Yukonify anything is you drape icicles off of it. So, they, Ogilvy had his camp on the Yukon. There were two camps of the Coasting Geodetic Survey on the Yukon and the, and the Porcupine River. I have to really go faster here, but on the other hand, we, don't, we have a missing colleague, so maybe I can just be allowed an extra minute or two. So the Camp Davidson was occupied, overwintered for two years on the Yukon. This is their eventual determination of 141 degrees. This is the determination by Ogilvy. They were close enough, they literally split the difference, there's the boundary. Now, this is their T-sheet map uh, along the Yukon River. If you change it in this direction as though you were coming up river in the Yukon, there was a bend right there and a, like a, a sandbar island on the left. This was done by, this is a map by the Coasting Geodetic Survey. This is the great Eskimo artist Guy Kokaryuk's painting in the Alaska State Museum of that sandbar uh, island and that bend in the river. This is his map of Camp Davidson. This map and that map were done at the very same time by people who were closely associated with each other. And the revelations of what I found out about Guy, uh, uh, um, Guy uh, Kokaryuk and his stepson, Joe Kokaryuk, he did a whole series of amazing maps for the Coasting Geodetic Survey a generation later during the Klondike has really occupied a lot of stuff. The last little part of that boundary dispute was getting very specific, not just verbal description, of the Russian territory, now part of Alaska, and its distinction from, from the British territory, now part of British Columbia. So the British Canadians had their view, where they got more land, and the Americans had their view, and they decided they, would have to, they were going to figure out a way to do this cooperatively. And Imagery and vision were fundamental to the whole way that they worked it out, the same way as like claiming land from a boat offshore, like imperialism by vision, that it was in the cooperative work of the British Canadians and the Americans in the, in the very end of the 19th century, early 20th century. That was the beginning of, of photogrammetry in the United States which is to say that they were, they, they were using calibrated cameras and image space, which could then turn into topography if you integrated image space from one location with an image from another location to determine the actual position of A, for example. So that was the, that was the last major episode in that era of defining things along the border. Later on during the Cold War, that extension of 141 degrees all the way up to the frozen ocean was done again by the Coast and Geodetic Survey and others in, in other forms using uh, in electronic instruments, etc. But th I love this particular graphic that was summarizing what was going to be going down with the Coast and Geodetic Survey during this, the hardships and excitement of the peculiar work. And it's so fundamentally peculiar because constantly constructing, reconstructing, reaffirming these boundaries on top of a landscape that show no traces of any natural divisions along those lines. And I wish I could show you as a, a final thing, a photograph that could do any sort of justice to that major line of the Treaty of Oregon, which I stumbled upon when I was a tree planter in the Idaho Panhandle in the 1970s. Every 10 years or so, Canada and the United States take turns cutting down every single tree that is growing for 2,000 miles along that actual border in this little narrow corridor so that the border between these 
great nations, is defined by a line of stumps that just goes to the horizon. It's just an art project of inconceivable scale and stupidity, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, in summary, you know, social theory. So I'll, I'll leave you with the, 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 the forlorn words that his friends put upon the grave of the great English poet, John Keats, who died, he, he drowned in a sailboat. And he was, his life was embittered at the end bitterness of the heart, the malicious power of enemies. And his situation was so bad that he said that he could only hope that, he, that his name would be writ in water, as though that was a very bad thing. But I would suggest that the whole concept of boundaries, ephemeral enough that you can just define them as, if, as temporary lines in water, makes perfect sense to the fish Thank you.